verses 1 to 5, and then it's verse 9 and 10. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel, and you shall become their <coughs> ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a compact, a compact with him at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah for seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. Verse 9. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward, and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. Good morning, everyone. Um, the second passage is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 2 to 10. It's in the Church Bible, page 116. It says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was cut up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my witnesses. Even if I choose to boast, sorry, I'll read that again. Even if I choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one would think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing, surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my witnesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in witnesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The third reading is taken from Mark chapter 6, verse 1 to 13 on uh, page 1008. It's titled, A Prophet Without Honor. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this wisdom that he has been given, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives 
and his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at the lack of faith. Then Jesus went round teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. There were his instructions, take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Thanks be to God. Lord, may the thoughts of my mind and the meditations of my heart, may they be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. There's Paul writing to the Corinthians <clears throat> about his weakness, about this thorn in his, in his flesh. Why did the Lord not take away that thorn in Paul's flesh? Why did he lay, allow that thorn to stay in him? I've been thinking about uh, when in a, per, a disciple's life breakthrough comes, at what point it comes. It comes in weakness and in brokenness. <clears throat> Very commonly, a person will be decide to make a commitment to following Jesus. Jesus normally talks about, writes people to come and follow him. He doesn't say, come and be my disciple. He says, come and follow me. And then they follow him down the road like this. He doesn't tell them what they're in, what's in store. They follow him down the road in the journey of life. And very commonly, so the Gospels tell us, it's a fantastic walk. Amazing things happen. Turn up in Cana, attend a wedding, find that, find that they've run out of wine, and here's this Jesus who miraculously turns water into wine. It must have been amazingly exciting to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, to be his disciple along this road. But as... The disciples, we follow Jesus along the road, inevitably and certainly at some point comes a moment when it becomes too hard, seemingly, to go on behind Jesus. And it's that, at that point that real deep discipleship actually begins, and it's at that point of brokenness at that point when you've hit the wall, when it seems that no further progress is possible, that you're on the brink of despair and you're thinking about quitting, that God's grace breaks in to your journey following Jesus. It's a holy place, a place of grace. Something shifts at that moment in the tectonic plates of your psyche. And I think back to that occasion in 2008, for example, in my own life. There I was in Cranbrook. I've mentioned it occasionally before at the annual parochial church meeting. And the, the town had flocked to the meeting to vote 
in a new PCC. The uh, votes were counted. It took them a long, long time because so many people had come. And when the church warden came forward and announced who had been elected and who hadn't been elected, in a sense, the, the ground caved in beneath me because everything I'd tried to build up for those uh, 10 years really sort of ran into the sand. And as I sat there at the desk in front of all these probably 200 people, um, normally 30 came. <laughs> On this occasion, it was a, a very, very large number. As I sit there in the, at the desk and try to absorb what had happened and what was happening, I experienced this extraordinary sense of rightness and peace that although everything I tried to build up seemingly um, was collapsing, I felt God's grace in this deep place just sitting there and very calm actually. Something was beginning to happen and I didn't really know what it was in my life. It's taken all these uh, years to now realize more fully what this is, place is about. Last night we had a wonderful celebration, I'll say a bit more about it later, but do you know of all the presents I got, Margareta and I got, one uh, was most, most precious to me, it will be I think forever really, I'll tell you about all the presents later. Um, but the most precious present, and the person who, gave, who provided this um, has given me permission to show you this. Um, this is a drawing, a sketch of Mother Teresa. Her face is very intense and focused, and there's a mixture of compassion and anger, but a, a far-sighted vision. This is no sentimental drawing. This is uh, somebody who's um, understood what the grit of Christian discipleship is about. In the point when things have gone badly wrong for us, the tectonic plates in our psyche shift and God's grace is then able to get in in a way that perhaps he couldn't until that point. It's a holy place. And Paul writes to the Corinthians, as we heard read there by China, These, this thorn came into Paul's flesh to prevent him from becoming conceited, to prevent him from falling into pride. <clears throat> Therefore, the thorn is a gift from God. A thorn gets stuck in your flesh, doesn't it? And there's nothing more you want when it's a thorn stuck in your flesh, in your foot or somewhere, than to get it out. You'll go to any lengths to be rid of the pain of the thorn in your flesh. You'll have anybody come with a pin and dig it out until you're finally rid of the pain. But here is Paul saying, God would not take out this thorn out of my flesh. I had to remain with this particular kind of pain in order to grow in order to be kept, uh, in his case, to be spared falling into the trap of conceit and pride. Now, we've all had thorns, and we've all got thorns. What is it for you? What's your thorn? It may be a difficult person. We all have difficult people. So I invite you to consider that that difficult person actually may be a gift of God. It may be a thorn that has to be there for your own growth. It could be your thorn, your attempt to control your emotions and the danger you, dangers you face of falling into temptation and into sin. It's a thorn, and you pray to God, take this away from me, because I don't want to fall into sin and fall into my temptation. Please just take it away. And he doesn't. Because the thorn has to stay there for your personal growth. can be the pain of physical afflictions. Some people say, 
that Paul's thorn, his, his flesh was an eye problem he had. Other people say, other scholars say, no, 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 it was his wife. I don't even know if he had a wife. <laughs> other people say it was the super apostles who were trying to rubbish him. We just don't know what Paul's thorn in his flesh was. But it could be a physical affliction that is just not going away. Many of you have physical afflictions and you ask, and we, God, please deliver me from this affliction. And, and we all pray and lay on hands and it doesn't go. What do we think in that moment? Do, this passage invites us to consider that maybe it's staying there, this thorn, this affliction, in order for you to make a particular kind of personal growth in your discipleship. The thorn then forces a dependency on grace. And the underlying Greek word for grace is haris, which also means, can you believe it, joy. Joy. So you see, when James writes in his letter, I consider my trials pure joy, you could translate it, I consider my trials pure grace. God allows us to get to this point of deadlock, of trial. He allows us to get to the point we have a thorn which won't go away. Why does he do this? I think we can dig down into this when we visit Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane. There he is. He knows he's... he's about to be arrested by the soldiers and taken off, tortured, crucified. And he would withdraws to pray in the darkness of the night, leaving Peter, James, and John to one side. And he prays alone, Father God, please take this cup of suffering away from me. And then he prays, but not my will, but your will be done. Jesus had to come to understand that his thorn would not be just thorn of crown of thorns, but a spear going through his side, nails going through his hands and feet, following an unbelievably difficult, painful torture. There we have the key in the Garden of Gethsemane. God gives us thorns so that our, we might die to our own will in order that the will of our Heavenly Father might be accomplished in our life, however difficult that may be. So we have to learn about a radical dependency on the grace of God. Friends, we are powerless in the face of ISIL in human terms debate is going on whether we should bomb Syria our politicians are under great pressure to resort to that but of course at one level they know that it's not going to really solve the problem because the terrorists uh, will simply hide amongst the wider population the civilian population and be mobile and embed amongst them and nothing really can be achieved in that way and as our Politicians are saying there is an existential threat to our very existence, the very way of life that we have come to love and know and fought, our fathers have fought for is under threat from the worldwide growth of ISIL. Aggressive Islam, not all Islam, but aggressive Islam has pushed the churches of the New Testament, that very church that was planted in Corinth, we were hearing a letter uh, being written to, that pushed the churches um, in, in Turkey off the map. Go down to Berry Park, many of the churches are in terminal decline, with the mosques still filled with literally thousands of people. When are we strong? When were we strongest as a church? Were we strongest as a national church in the Victorian age when churches, for example, were being planted all around Luton, big churches which were full of people? Were we strongest in the Victorian era? Or are we strongest action today? 
For Paul says, when we are weak, then we are strong. When we are weak, we are strong. The deep paradox of the gospel. Christianity at the same time, as we know it in the West, is under existential threat from secular humanism. Two guns at our head, if you like, or one gun and something else on the other side. Bend the knee to Allah or bend the knee to godless secularity. Who will we bend the knee to? Terrifying pressures all around us that are increasing, either bombs and guns or smoothies and parties. Threatening either to destroy us or to seduce us into a godless life without God. And Christians like us squeezed into a trembling, isolated, holy huddle. Jesus sent them out, the twelve, as Margareta read to us, into such a world as this. Imagine the conversation Jesus had with the twelve, having chosen them, them before he sent them out. Just imagine it for a moment. Jesus, it's surely all right for us to take a little bit of money. No. Jesus, can we not take at a, a, a least a, one or two items of spare clothing so we won't get smelly? No. Jesus, a um, bit of food for the journey. No. Jesus, um, can we book a place in a B and B, please? Or you know, Holiday Inn. No. Nope. What could we take then, Jesus? Can we take anything at all? A staff. A set of sandals. What? Jesus, can't we just stay at home? It's much easier to stay at home. Why do you have to send us out? We have only just called us to heaven's sake. Why are you sending us out? Anything else, Jesus, you've given us for this mission you're sending us on? Spiritual authority. Spiritual authority to drive out the demons. Right. Off we go. Jesus passes on his authority to the twelve. Authority rooted not in anything other than the extreme vulnerability to which he calls them. They are weak. Not even a diploma in biblical studies. Nothing, no thing other than a staff and a set of sandals. Radical vulnerability. They are weak. But when they are weak, then the gospel tells us they are strong. For power, writes St. Paul, power is made perfect in weakness. Jesus, it seems, deliberately denies them all possible support systems. Their needs have to be met by, their, the, very, by the very ones they are trying to reach. He sends them out with nothing, not even food, not even a bed for the night. He sends them out with nothing. Therefore, their needs will have to be met by those people they're going to knock on the door of. Remember Jesus walking into Sichar, that Samaritan village, meeting a woman at the well. I'm thirsty. Did you forget your water bottle, Jesus? I'm thirsty. Please, can I have a drink? Jesus' mission beginning in weakness, vulnerability, thirst, hunger, weakness. I'm going out at the moment. This is kind of scratching where I'm at, but itching a little bit. Please, uh, Please, can I have just a two-bedroom flat to live in somewhere in walking distance from the station? Who's going to pay? Have you got a job? Uh, no. Who's going to pay? The Church of England is going to pay for my flat for three years. Mm, we'll have to see about that. Jesus, why are you sending us out on this mission? They might slam the door in our faces. Jesus replies, yes, some will. 
Some will do that, but don't worry, just kind of move on. Brush the dust underneath your feet. Move on, because as in another passage of the gospel, parallel passage, Jesus says, find the person of peace. Somewhere amongst, amongst all these people to whom I am sending you will be the person of peace. Stay there. Allow your needs to be met. Radical dependency on grace. Seeing everything, every trial, as an opportunity to be, to be actually less self-reliant and more reliant on God. Do you remember that passage from last week? That wonderful scripture from, also from 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, 4. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. There you have it in a nutshell. Jesus himself, who was rich beyond all measure in the glory of heaven, emptied himself, poured himself out by taking up life in this world. And in doing so, he was able to bring about transformation. We could say, for we know that it is when we are most hard up against it that his grace abounds and we receive spiritual authority and with it, amazingly, peace and even joy. Come back with me for a moment to the 14th century in Italy. There was a rich young nobleman who uh, had a wonderful life as a soldier and states and everything. And uh, he was in church one day and he, he heard the gospel read about the rich young ruler going away sad when Jesus called him to give up everything. He decided in that moment I cannot just follow the way of the rich young ruler. I have to follow the way of Jesus. So he went to the town, to the town square where his father was there, his rich, noble father, and he disinherited himself by taking off all his clothes. Shock, horror, radical prophetic act. His father was shocked to the core. Francis of Assisi, and following that, a whole worldwide movement of mission began from that one single act that Francis took of becoming as vulnerable as it was possible to be, giving everything away. For me, at the moment, as you know, it's something rather less radical. I'm not planning to disinherit myself and strip off naked in, 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 in St. George's Square. You'll be glad to hear but for me, it means at the moment, leaving this lovely church and you lovely people, leaving my stipend and um, uh, living half of the week in the rough and tumble of the poorest parts of Luton. Actually, it's not a very big step, really. But for me, I've had a very comfortable existence all my life, a very pampered existence, really. I've never been without or anything. For me, it's actually quite a big step to make, and I'm a little bit frightened. But I believe that God's grace will come because of that. For you, this is important you hear this, for you, it will be something utterly, utterly unique for you. I don't know what it will be for you. So what's your thorn? It may be something you can't speak of. It be something too shameful. It may be something that you it would not actually help anybody if you uh, disclose what it was. It might be the boss you have at work or the person you sit next to or, or whatever. But I just invite you to consider that rather than thinking or even praying, Lord, just get rid of this person or this thorn or this, this problem that I have or this temptation, I just invite you to consider, as we've been doing, that that thorn may be there for a purpose. 
a purpose of keeping you humble, keeping you God-sufficient rather than self-sufficient, and so that your heart and your mind and your life is constantly and ever-increasingly open to receiving God's grace. Because you see, when we are full and have everything we need and all our needs are met, and we have listened carefully to the voice of the, the wider community and got everything right, and we have it all, it's very, very difficult then, it seems, to be open, truly open, to God's grace and to receiving it. So if you're weak, if you feel empty, if you feel vulnerable, that may be a very holy place to be. A very precious place where God is able to work out his will for your life. His will for your life embedded in the community of the church and the wider community. For when you are weak, then you are strong. For his grace will be sufficient for you. Amen. I think we should have the prayers.